this stage of events, Leonidas needed to implement his unity of command within the ranks of his defenders. When the actual fighting began, the unity of command had to somehow take effect within the ranks of his individual soldiers. This concept mirrors the modern chain of command model wherein authority passes down from the top through a series of military ranks in which each person is accountable to a superior. Because Leonidas could not have trusted the morale, skill, and loyalty of the other Greek states, he designated his 300 Spartans as the main phalanx officers. According to Greek military protocol, the phalanx structure was divided into six mori, or regiments. Each hoplite regiment would have one colonel, four captains, eight lieutenants, and 16 sergeants. The purpose of this subdivision was for every soldier in the hoplite to receive and follow the orders of the formation and attack from the commander with the utmost reliability. This leadership structure enabled Leonidas to maintain complete control and unity of command throughout his force. Any chance for a formidable defense depended upon every individual soldier to perform any task at hand with the utmost prestige. According to the commands of Leonidas in every phase of the battle waiting to commence, King Leonidas and his defending force held off the Persian offense successfully for three days by their use of mass. Mass as a principle of war means organizing all the elements of combat power at your disposal to have a decisive effect on your enemy. In the Battle of Thermopylae, this principle applies to the unit's size, arms, armor, and battle formations under the Persian and Greek commands. In regard to the Persians' use of mass, their strength and numbers had been their saving grace in most of their previous conquests and battles. Strength and numbers had favored the Persian army as they had been unharmed and increased in size from their departure from Asia until they had finally reached Thermopylae. According to Herodotus, the Persian army and naval forces totaled around 2,200,000 fighting men. Now, I want to add right here and interject that this number could actually be quite inaccurate, but I'm just going to go by the primary sources listed in this paper. Based on recruiting strength gained from the northern countries and Greek city-states who submitted to Xerxes, this force would increase in size to over 2,600,000 men. Historians lately, of course, have disputed whether Herodotus was exaggerating his calculations of Xerxes' numbers, and have set them at around 500,000, which I personally also agree with. Xerxes' forces from Asia consisted of Persians, Medes, and Sake, while recruits from the various northern countries such as Thrace, Paeonia, Macedonia, Magnesia, and many others replenished his infantry, cavalry, and naval power. This great diversity among Xerxes' warriors implied that their weaponry was equally diverse among each soldier. And I want to point out right there that diversity in weapons and armor can also have a negative effect on an army as to where the greeks and spartans would have realistically have been fighting with very similar if not the exact same tools of warfare so the persians would have used almost every conceivable weapon available at their disposal including bows slings spears swords javelins and daggers their primary weapon for both hunting and warfare would be the bow, which the cavalry and infantry units used extensively. The javelin made for thrusting and throwing was their next prime weapon. After this, they relied on simple daggers and short bladed swords if the fight came into close proximity revolving around hand-to-hand -hand combat. Their choice of arms suggested they preferred to fight at longer ranges, 
with support from their cavalry and mounted archer units. Such a fighting style required them to wear little or no body armor. Once again, we're seeing how this all works to the advantage of the Greek defenders. They are already eliminating their ability to actively use cavalry. They're limiting the attack points in which the Persian army can use its missiles. And this lack of armor and the hesitation to engage in close quarter combat is going to put the Persians at a great disadvantage. An exception to wearing little or no body armor would apply to Xerxes' elite unit, the Immortals, who were about 10,000 strong at Thermopylae. While carrying a wicker work or leather shield effective against protecting themselves from projectile weapons, they wore leather corslets covered with bands of iron and bronze, but had no armor protection for their legs. Unfortunately, little is known about their specific battle formations or organizations. The Persians managed to secure one of the largest empires in human history by fighting in the open and in many cases flat areas of Asia and Egypt, where mobility and the ability to use cavalry had been their primary advantage. Yet the narrow passageway at Thermopylae showed the ineffectiveness of this kind of warfare and proved hardly a match for the heavily armored Greek hoplite phalanx. Even with a limited fighting force comprising around 4,000 warriors, even though the Spartans and their 300 typically get the most credit, I feel like sometimes the, the rest of the Greeks are uh, unfairly left out of this battle. But let me get back on track here. The Greeks' method of fighting in the hoplite phalanx proved ideal in such a restricted area as Thermopylae presented. The basic principle of the phalanx was to form a wall of armor with every soldier holding the shield in his left hand, protecting the right side of the neighboring soldier. This presented a line of shields and armor able to deflect the onslaught of an oncoming assault. Appearance in battle was every bit as important to the Spartan warriors as their ability to fight. The Greek historian Xenophon, who served along with the Spartan army for many years after the Persian War, describes the appearance of one of these elite Spartan hoplite warriors. For the actual encounter under arms, the following inventions attributed to Lycurgos. The soldier had a crimson-colored uniform and a heavy shield of bronze. His theory being that such equipment had a masculine association, and it's altogether warrior-like. He further permitted those who were about the age of early manhood to wear their hair long, for so he conceived they would appear of larger stature, more free and indomitable, and a more terrible aspect. The appearance of just one of these heavily armored Spartan warriors must have looked intimidating indeed to the primitively clad Persians. The Greek hoplites generally used the Corinthian-style helmet of bronze or iron that protected the entire head, face, and collarbone, which was especially vulnerable to a sword slash. The torso and trunk were either protected by a composite corslet of leather covered with metal scales or two bronze plates covering the front and the back and laced together at the sides. The armored hoplites were still vulnerable to archer and missile fire, which the Persians used heavily. The hoplites were able to advance quickly on the Persians before they could fire their arrows, yet the best strategy was to remain stationary and wait for the enemy to charge into them. The main source of protection came from the heavy shields the hoplites bore made of wood and covered in bronze. The shield's average diameter, depending upon personal preference, was between three to five feet, enough to protect the neck down to the thigh. The hoplites also wore greaves, carefully molded to fit their legs in case the shield missed a low sword slash. Being protected as thus, the hoplites stood prepared to slaughter the enemy close in with their simple but highly effective weaponry. With a wall of hoplite shields positioned forward in the phalanx, 
The principal weapon in such a tight formation was the famous bronze-tipped, ash-shafted spear, measuring six feet long. Such a weapon was not intended to be thrown like a javelin, but to form a fence with the other spears to impale the advancing enemy. As a thrusting weapon, the spear held in the hands of master warriors such as the Spartans had the advantage to overcome any adversary armed with swords or shorter spears commonly used by the Persians. But as the battle progressed and spears shattered and splinted, the hoplites relied on a short sword with a curved blade, representing something similar to that of an Indian Gurkha. The Greeks would have used the sword extensively within the final moments of fighting before the Persians finally overwhelmed them. Surprisingly, at this period in Greek history, the hoplites never relied on the bow and arrow as a prominent weapon in combat. Some could say that they would have even considered it cowardly, the ability to escape harm while firing at your enemy from a safe distance. Such would have been Xerxes' intent to first engage and attempt to reduce the armored Greek enemy from a distance prior to deploying his foot soldiers. Accordingly, Leonidas, his Spartan elite, and the rest of the Greek hoplites had to depend on Xerxes' troops to meet them head-on in attempts to bypass the mountain pass. Luckily for Leonidas, Thermopylae served as the perfect setting for the Greeks to showcase their true fighting proficiency and capability. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.